was reared as a Christian, and my parents were very strict Methodists. No alcohol in the house. We didn't play cards. Well, we weren't supposed to play cards. And all of this was part of my upbringing. And then once I went to college, I started encountering a completely different world. And by completely different world for a Methodist, this meant Calvinism and Presbyterianism. Oh, these guys are so much smarter than the Methodists. This is how I thought I was such an idiot. And I'm still an idiot. And when I look at these things now, I read myself into Calvinism. And in one sense, reading myself into Calvinism saved me from some of the, well, let us say Methodist excesses of enthusiasm, moral rigorism and such. And so I became a Calvinist. This is how I proceeded through all my graduate studies. And, but it was while I was a Calvinist that I started then colliding with things because I, to become a student of church history says uh, Cardinal Newman, is to stop being a Protestant. And, well, I was a student of church history. And I came upon a man, he was, I did my dissertation on him, my first book, uh, Bishop John Jewell of Salisbury, who was uh, a brilliant orator, a man who could easily amass the facts. And this goes back to something that I've talked about, about imagination. How did Jewell and what was Jewel do, doing in imagining the facts? Because between him and his Catholic interlocutors, his arguers, they were just throwing facts at each other. And the question is, well, why does your interpretation of the facts trump theirs? And ultimately it comes down to what is their rule of faith, their canon of persuasion? And the best way for me to explain it is this, and it's a short anecdote, but in 1519, Luther is debating Eck, Johann Eck at Leipzig. It is a big important point in turning in, in the whole early story of Luther. And Eck pushes Luther, Eck was a brilliant man, and Eck basically says, if your doctrine of justification of faith is true, why need we pray for the dead? Well, seemingly, Luther had never been confronted with this before. And so Luther just blurts out, I deny prayers for the dead. And then Eck pushes him more. Then what will you do with Maccabees? And Luther says, I reject Maccabees as part of the canon. Now, Luther could have a tenuous string on which to say, I reject Maccabees because Jerome was not big on Maccabees. But basically, the rest of the church accepted Maccabees. And what Luther has done is Luther has basically made his doctrine determinative of what is the rule of faith. In other words, his rule of faith was his doctrine of justification by faith alone. Not Holy Scripture, which often is what he would say, I'm bound to the Word of God. And suddenly I realized that a whole new rule of faith was being developed. Not the ancient rule of faith that we had come to see that God has revealed himself to us in Christ. And so this was just kind of bracing. Now, I had already been reading Orthodox thought and Orthodox theology, but this realization basically said, ah, 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 I'm no longer a Protestant. How can I even think that I'm a Protestant? And, and so, this, and so the, the struggle actually begins in earnest. And I had met uh, my MA advisor, was a wonderful man named uh, Aristides Papadakis, still alive, still wonderful, still still lecturing, but he had been my MA advisor at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. And, and he had basically put things in my ear, not, not whisperings as though he were trying to, you know, oh, orthodoxy so much better. We have better wine and better food. Well, we do have better wine and better food, but that's not what he was whispering. But he made me think about things differently, and so all of these things start colliding. It's, it's kind of like a computer having conflicts. And for those of us who have PCs, this is what it is. It's, it's the equivalent of a theological blue screen of death. All of a sudden, my operating system wasn't working, and I had to kind of come back to this, what is doing it? And this, of course, in many ways coincided with a crisis of faith that had been going on for a few years because I was overwhelmed. I was overwhelmed with doubt. 
which for a Presbyterian is, I mean, it's almost a sin to doubt. You're not trusting God if you doubt. And eventually, I, I, this is what drove me to orthodoxy and to exploring orthodoxy more. And then once having decided, I'm leaving Presbyterianism, I'm going to start attending the Orthodox Church. Uh, a, a year before I even left Presbyterianism, I had renounced my orders. I'd been ordained. I renounced my orders, and I just simply stayed in the church. I didn't want to be somebody in a hurry. And of course, once I got to Orthodoxy, I realized nobody's in a hurry. You get to be a catechumen for a year. And, but it's just been being within Orthodoxy. And to go back to an analogy I've used often, I stopped being the man who stood against the wall watching everyone dance. And the analogy's not original with me. Watching everyone dance, and I finally got out on the dance floor. And this is what brought me into orthodoxy. I'm not someone who is going to damn everyone that I've left behind. Uh, I love them. I wish the best for them. I wish them to become orthodox. Because the thing that then kind of resolves is suddenly doubt no longer becomes this horrifying thing. Doubt is simply something saying to me, you, you have a conflict that you need to resolve and you need to think about this. And while I don't have assurance that I will be saved, I have something so much better. I have peace. I have peace that I'm united to Christ. And that, yes, I may fall away, but I have this peace now which goes beyond anything I've ever understood. And so this, in many ways, this in short has been my road to orthodoxy. 